design and fabrication. At the end of 2006, uh, Design to Production teamed up with architect Arnold Waltz and became a commercial consulting practice. Since then, having implemented digital production chains for projects like the Hungerbird Furnicular in on Innsbruck, the EPFL Learning Center in Lausanne, or the Semper Center Pompidou in Metz. Since 2009, he's been a visiting professor at the AA's EmTech program here. So please welcome Fabian. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Thanks for the invitation. Sorry, Benjamin, for the swap. Um, <laughs> <coughs> yeah, closing the gap was the theme that I found on the program. That's what I'm trying to do. If it's working or not, do I have to switch it on? Just go forward here. Just do anything. can skip this because uh, uh, Alan's already read it, so um, this is one half of design production, maybe me, this is the other half. Alan Waltz, there's two uh, offices, one in, in Zurich, one in Stuttgart, in Zurich there's four people at the moment in, in Stuttgart, more or less the same. Uh, and when we got to know each other, we quickly realized that we were basically working on two ends of the same thing, me more on the uh, fabrication and optimization side at the ETH, doing research, Arnold, uh, more on the design side together with the architects. He's been working with architects and building parametric models for rather large complex projects uh, for the last more than 10 years. Probably was one of the first to do something like parametric modeling without any parametric model other than AutoLisp and AutoCAD. Um, for example, the Mercedes-Benz Museum and a few others. Uh, and we decided to put this together and found design to production uh, as a consultancy to help architects, engineers, fabricators, everybody involved uh, in the digital production of complex design. So we are more or less deliberately sit sitting in the middle between all chairs, um, the little specialist uh, bubble that uh, Wolf drew in one of his uh, diagrams are there. Thank you for mentioning this. Um, and and uh, yeah, helping to somehow formalize the thinking uh, of the of everybody down to a level where digital fabrication <laughs> can actually read it and do something with that. Um, one of the first projects that we've done, or that I've done, as a commercial practice, uh, is this Hungerburg funicular routes by Saar in Innsbruck. Um, four stations for a cable car going up the hill in Innsbruck. Uh, with those nice glass roofs, and a very small part in the roof construction, basically, is what we've done, namely the connectors between the steel structure inside and the glass panels, which are actually doubly curved on the outside. Um, as a subcontractor of the engineers, in this case, Bolling and Roman and Frankfurt, all of us here also, um, the problem is those are non-standard structures with a more or less freeform geometry, and you end up with two and a half thousand individual components that you need to fabricate uh, to get this done. And somebody has to break it down from uh, uh, the geometry model that is there into fabrication data um, that can actually drive the machine through big sheets of polyurethane material to cut out those pieces, drill all the holes and everything. So you have to basically model the whole thing, uh, nest it on boards, um, until you have things like that, you can ship to uh, to Innsbruck to be installed on the structure. Um, <coughs> one project uh, that was done is this uh, golf club roof in South Korea by Shigeru Ban. Um, looks a bit familiar. I mean, the structure is comes out of the same stable as the uh, the Popular in Metz, obviously. Uh, actually, this started after the Sancho Pompidou in Metz, but it was finished half a year earlier. Um, it's a bit smaller, only three and a half thousand square meters. Uh, where we did the parametric modeling for the timber construction company, Blumen Lehmann, which means uh, we had to basically define the geometry to some surface reconstruction with a partner from Zurich ICAP, um, break it down into 
three and a half thousand components in the end. There's a bit of repetition, as you can see in there, so it's only 500 individual components, uh, but they're connected with about 15,000 map joints that are barely uh, visible. So at every crossing, basically, you have two um, good old-fashioned timber connections, lap joints, but since the whole thing is curved, uh, also the connections are curved, which means the single pieces look somewhat like that. <coughs> Cut on a CNC, five-axis machine in Switzerland, and then shipped down to South Korea together with 30 timber guys to install the whole thing. Then, and I don't have to lose many words about this because Sophie has taken over the job of explaining it, um, the Sancho Pompidou in Metz, again, parametric modeling for the timber construction company, this uh, time Holzbau Ammann in Germany. Um, the interesting thing is we actually had to do a bit of surface reconstruction in the beginning also because everything that the um, timber contractor got was not a, a chicken wire mesh, uh, but a DXF mesh, which is uh, for sure not curved, but just straight lines in between the connection points. So there needed to be a bit of reconstruction there. Um, and then breaking that down also into, in this case, the, those 1800 curved components that you've already seen, including all the nasty little bits like optimizing the fiber cutting angles and 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 um, <coughs> Which then looks like this in the end, you've seen this already. Um, another very interesting thing where we basically work way down in the food chain is the Rolex Learning Center by Sana at the EPFL in Lausanne. Uh, basically a 20,000 square meter pavilion, one story. Um, a, with a rather regular nine by nine meter grid and a, a steel roof on top. But um, it stands on a doubly curved concrete slab of, uh, yeah, the, con the doubly curved part is about seven and a half thousand square meters. And it undulates up and down over roughly six and a half meters. Um, we were involved by losing a general contractor first to basically um, break down the structure into about 1,500 wooden boxes that would form this homework uh, for the concrete. And they had to uh, develop together with Bolling and Roman who did the, the engineering of this project. Um, and then um, went to the other side of the tender process to uh, the formwork contractor, Rao, uh, and uh, take this detailed geometry that you can see there on the upper right half, that's about 10,000 individual timber pieces in there. Break this down into actually the uh, NC cutting data for the machine that we're using, including all the documentation stuff they needed to build this whole work. <coughs> um, the whole slab basically was cut in one in one go. I was not cut in one go, I was cast in one go. So they had a 48 hour casting session on that, which was pretty impressive, I think. And the, the result is, is uh, Pretty amazing if you are uh, ever close to Lausanne, you should pay the visit. Um, a smaller project that we've done also in, in a team with Bolling and Roman in Paris is uh, this interior design for Hermes uh, by Rina Dumas, uh, interior architects in Paris. Um, three of those uh, sort of wool, they call it in. in, in pavilions inside an old swimming hall that uh, was turned into a retail uh, uh, into a shop by, by for, for Hermes and a staircase. Uh, again, for the timber contractor, breaking the geometry down into about 4,000 pieces, all those slats, those doubly curved slats you can see, they are basically cut from straight boards um, and then glued together in three layers so you can uh, have one of the one of the curvature directions is, is achieved by cutting it on a three-axis machine out of planar wood slat, uh, wooden, wooden panels. And the other direction is basically achieved by bending it over a scaffolding and uh, gluing three layers of 40 millimeter ash uh, on top of each other. Um, letting it dry, then dismantling the whole thing, shipping it to Paris and re-erecting it there. Also involved, of course, unrolling all this geometry, nesting it onto raw boards uh, and generating the, the uh, or preparing it in this case because they did the programming in terms of preparing that for NC programming on the machine. 
So it's just 4,000 of those slats up there that you have to put together in the right order. Um, and then the last project in this rather short talk, and that's the one that I'm going to explain in a bit more detail, is a Kill Performing Arts Center in Kristiansand, Norway, by ALA Architects. Um, it's a three and a half thousand square meter doubly curved timber wall um, on this theater and concert house. Um, where we were approached by a timber fabricator in Norway uh, and basically took the already uh, experienced team of uh, Lima Timber, our Swiss uh, uh, timber construction company, and SJB, the engineers up there, to resolve this and in the end provide fabrication data for all the pieces. You see there's basically an elemented solution. As you can see on the right-hand side, there's 126 elements in there that are prefabricated and then hoisted into the steel structure, um, employing about 1,700 of those curved um, A bit more detail. This basically is a, a big concrete box with a rather dramatic front. It's got a straight upper edge and a curved lower edge and a <coughs> what is mathematically called a ruled surface in between. And the idea was to have um, only straight twisted boards running down this facade and a nice little pinstripe pattern on that, 10 millimeter gaps going straight down the whole uh, facade from the straight upper edge to the lower edge. Um, that was pretty complicated to say the least because the problem is if you want to have those 10 millimeter pinstripes going down, how do you measure a longer curve surface? I mean, you can imagine too. Basically, the way do you nail those boards onto the construction? Um, the, the answer, of course, is you don't. You, you do something like this little detail here where you have sort of a uh, small seat cut for every single board because you cannot measure things like that. There's 125,000 oak boards in this facade. If you start measuring every single one into the right place, you'll never get finished. Um, you use a five-axis timber machining center here at Luma Lima that has a working volume of about 20 by one and a half, by one and a half meters. So basically, this is the machine you see. There's a box of five by five by five meters, um, and then there's 20 meters to the left and 20 meters to the right where you can feed in a beam and take it out on the other side. And they are pretty precise. They work with a tolerance of some tenth of a millimeter, not really one tenth of a millimeter, but something in between one and five tenths. So you can actually fabricate things like that on those machines with the right precision. Um, the only thing is, you have to come up with about 55,000 of those seat cuts on the curve beams. Um, and that is pretty expensive because the machine, as you can see here, has to go through every seat cut three times because of the size of the things, which means you're easily adding probably one and a half machine months uh, to the fabrication time there, and the machine hour comes at something like 150 Swiss francs, which is close to 150 euros, I don't know, in Swiss pound, uh, in, in, in British pounds at the moment, um, which means quite a bit of money. Um, on the other hand, at, at the end of the chain, where somebody has to put things together, that probably saves a few men months of measuring and figuring things out. So you have to fabricate 1,700 of those, uh, which are of course all different, uh, and a few straight ones to put things together. Um, and then you need another fabrication partner who has a five-axis CNC cutting and drilling uh, machine. A boat builder's workshop in Norway, they know how to handle oak, um, and they know how to handle curved oak boards. Here they're still all straight, but then they have to be at least uh, twisted a bit. Those guys have to, to cut 125,000 boards. Oh, sorry, 12,500. Still enough, all nicely lumbered. Um, they had to drill 125,000 holes into those boards because they had to fit also. Um, which means somebody, again, had to provide all the fabrication data for that. Means every single board has a nice little G-code file with everything in there from cutting to planing to uh, drilling the holes. Um, then everything was shipped um, to Norway already there, pre-assembled, uh, and that's another point where I have to add to, um, to Wolf, 
This is all about prefabrication. The trick here is if you want to do this on site, dangling from the top of a 20 meter high structure or building a large scaffolding underneath, you're never going to make it. Um, at least not with the precision that the designer wanted in this case. Um, this is basically all done on the ground on little um, jigs here where you can see that there's a special jig holding the straight beam or the curved beams and then there's a little laser reflector for measuring the thing so that the frame for the element is precise in the beginning. And then you put on all the other parts in this case, the heading board, like a large IKEA puzzle. Um, and they all snap into place. Not only the, the boards have little seat cuts, also all the connections between the beams have little seat cuts. So there's basically no measuring apart from this little laser thing here to make sure that the four corners are in the right position and everything else basically is defined by that already. Um, you can see those elements are rather large. Um, they're actually up to 50 square meters <coughs> in surface, which only work because both the building site uh, and uh, the pre-assembly site, which was the boat builders workshop, are close to the ocean, or at least the sun in, in, uh, in Norway, so we could ship the whole thing. No way you could, could do land transport for that. Um, that means we only had to do 126 elements of up to 50 square meters instead of a couple of hundred that could be uh, transported on a truck. And then the whole thing has to be installed on site into a steel framework. Uh, if you remember the beginning, we had uh, uh, the challenge of having 10 millimeter gaps between all the boards. And that means also between the, the boards between two elements. Um, the steel contractor wanted a tolerance of 30 millimeters in the structure. So you have to come up with a few clever details to actually account for the very, very bad tolerances in the steel construction to still have all the gaps at 10 millimeters going up the structure. Um, and then the whole thing still has to hold in the end. That is what it looked like during erection. So you have this glass facade actually parting the whole timber facade into uh, two parts, the inner and the outer part, which are different <coughs> also in terms of the layers of the, of the facade. Um, sounds pretty straightforward. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of different pieces, about 14,000 altogether. Um, but it's manageable if you look into a few things in more detail. I mean, you have those five-axis cutting machines which allow for very precise free-form geometries, uh, as I say, about five-tenths of a millimeter. Um, you have, by definition, a ruled surface, which means you can have straight boards running down the facade. Of course, they have to get uh, wider to the lower end of the facade because the straight line on the top is much shorter than the curved line at the bottom. So every single board has to be cut individually because they're all tapered. Uh, and they're uh, rotating from more than 70 degrees and points like that to horizontal up there. So they're all slightly twisted. Um, and then you build this model and suddenly things like that happen. You say, hey, what's that? I mean, they get smaller to the top. I knew that. But vanishing, that was not discussed yet. <coughs> and in all our models that we, that, we, that we did in the early phases, that didn't happen. So we had a closer look at the geometry that we got from the architects and found out that um, most of the isocurves up the facade, which is a view from the top, were parallel to the building actors, except for here, where it was slightly <coughs> rotated. And we said, hey, that, that can't be. I mean, they are smart guys. They know how to, to build a geometry like that in a rhino model. Uh, that's not a mistake. And we asked back and said, yeah, and the problem was there's a, there's a concert hall on, in, behind this on this side. And it got a bit too big because of the emergency exit in there. Um, so instead of moving the concert uh, hall inside or moving the facade outside, they just twisted the geometry of the facade a little bit get a little bulge and the emergent X fits nicely behind it. Of course, this blows up the whole construction principle of the <laughs> Um Which is bad because um, uh, out of our 126 elements, uh, 120 would 
perfectly work with one system, and then you have to develop another system for the remaining six, or a completely new system for all of them. <coughs> that is to show a local optimization in projects like this can lead immediately to a global versification <laughs> of the whole thing. You have to be very careful. Everything is more or less connected to everything else, and sometimes you get really bad side effects. So we sorted that out by moving forward the facade one and a half meters in this corner here, down there, to get a nicely um, continuously curved reference surface that matched the construction principles and was the basis for, again, breaking the whole thing down into all those components. Um, another thing, of course, was to come up with this construction principle, which means, okay, you have a, a series of straight steel beams that basically were predefined to hold the facade. Um, how do you actually build those elements up from straight timber beams and curved timber beams that sometimes have to be segmented because this highly curved beam would fit through the CNC machine in the end. <coughs> so there's another joint in there and all those boards. Um, and they have to be easy to fabricate, they have to be easy to assemble, they have to be easy to transport by ship in this case. They have to be easy to install with the given tolerances of 30 millimeters on the steel structure and they have to be easy to maintain in the end. So you really have to sit down around the table with everybody involved in the whole process and discuss things down to the last screw that has to be attached to something. Because if you only look at one point, um, the fabricator of the curve beams tells you it's far too expensive to do all those seat cuts up there. And if you don't have the guys that actually have to assemble the whole thing on the same table, they cannot stand up and say, yeah, but it's gonna save us even more time if we do that. So you really have to look into the whole thing at the same time. You have to build a model with those 14,000 components and about 60,000 connections, which means you have to make up your mind how you handle this amount of data in, a, in, in one CAD system. This is all the cladding boards you can see there. Um, you have to think about interfaces to other guys, like the engineers, for example. Well, this is your, um, your point here. So how does this work back and forth? And it works like sending back and forth Excel sheets. That's the, that's the, uh, the simplest way of doing it. And um, yeah, we're doing this all the time, aren't we? Um, you have to provide documentation like the little IKEA sheet that tells you how to assemble <coughs> things and how things are named and which board with which number goes where so that everybody comes together in the end. 426 elements in this case. And this is only one set of plan drawings. There's another set. <coughs> this is for the, for the um, um, installation on site. There's another one where the elements are slightly rotated into the assembly position. There's another one showing all the boards and then and then. That means you have to team up. This is a rather typical situation that we have on projects like this. With us here way down in the food chain and the client up there and a lot of players in between. Uh, and a lot of partners that we're working with. Um, basically, I've been talking to all of them in this project, all the time. And at least two thirds of them, at some point, received some data out of our parametric model, did something with that and sent it back. <coughs> so this is the typical situation of working, where we are those, yeah, in, in Wood's model, those specialists down there, basically talking to everybody involved. Um, and bringing things together in a way. So, what we're talking about is, we're talking about taking all these things that have to be clarified during a project like that, and moving them closer together. This is about integration, this is about sitting together, not only um, on Skype or whatever, but sitting together around one table to clarify things. Um, to get things together, and our job in there is basically to write the minutes in form of a highly formalized parametric model that then holds the information that everybody needs to put things together to fabricate things. And, so. and we see this as actually sort of a craft in an abstract uh, um, understanding. Um, we're actually trying to get our hands dirty, even in the workshop, to see what the, the guys down there are doing. 
uh, to understand what they're doing, but also we see what we're doing as craftsmanship in a way that it's about quality, it's about looking at the whole process, it's about being involved into everything that is concerned with the whole project um, to get the quality right in the end. Like that, pinstripes up the wall. Thank you very much. Okay, last talk before lunch. I'm sure everybody's uh, quite hungry. Um, finally, I'd like to introduce Benjamin Cora, uh, who's a graduate of the school. Um, Benjamin was born in Frankfurt and grew up in Miami, Florida. He studied film and music at the University of Miami before coming here to do his diploma project. Um, for which he was awarded a bronze medal commendation and an SOM fellowship and the Iguzini Award at the 2005 Rebus President's Medals for his project entitled Harmonic Proportion in Amorphic Form. Ben went on to work as a programmer for the AGU at Ara and then for Herzog and Demoren in Basel and Hamburg. He's the founder and managing director of One to One Computational Geometry, a consultancy set up in 2009. Past and current projects include the Philharmonic uh, building in Hamburg, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, and the Philharmonic in Paris. So please put your hands together for Benjamin.